a time where everyone hides behind either a Roman statue or anime profile picture. It can be difficult to appreciate modern attempts at social commentary without first wondering what they're trying to sell you or who they want to convince you to vote for. At the rate we're going, satire will end up in the same lost knowledge category along with Roman concrete, Greek fire, and pre-World War II British food. As a professional clown myself, satire's death is the most concerning thing in the world today. Screw you, climate change. I have other concerns. Chiefly among them, the privilege to hide dirty jokes inside children's movies and satirical content with just enough subtlety and 69 jokes that it goes over the head of most people. We used to be a civilization that can make a game all about early 90s gangbangers and not have months of online discussion over the politics of which consulting company is to blame for the decision to switch from white main characters. Because the reason was simple. It was mostly funny when covering serious issues like police corruption, gang violence, and the drug epidemic all the cartoons in the 90s tried to warn you about. San Andreas may as well be the high watermark for video game satire. Not that that's hard. Video games tend to suck at comedy, which is good for me. I can count the amount of games that focus on comedy on one hand, and I can safely cut off a few fingers when counting the ones that were good at it. Comedy's hard, and games are long, and the longer a piece of entertainment is, the less comedy works. So instead it gets used as filler to lighten the mood between all the scenes directed by film students who run video game productions these days. Grand Theft Auto used to be the only game that could pull off satirizing America while still being a pretty decently long video game. Notice the word use, set off by apostrophes, spoken louder, and highlighted in red in my script. GTA 4 had only trace amounts of the series' admittedly juvenile sense of humor, but accurately juvenile because the US is a very immature place. GTA 3's humor was as blunt as the graffiti on a restroom stall, and kneecapped by a silent main character who could never play the straight man while existing in a non-distinct time period of the early 2000s. Vice City wasn't much different from that, but it did manage to nail the 80s at least. But for one brilliant moment, they had Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, based in what I still consider the perfect setting in a GTA game. The 90s in Los Angeles. There's more charm rolled into the cast of San Andreas than all the other games combined, especially its main character CJ. He's the only GTA protagonist that ever really worked. Nico came close at times, and GTA 5 split the main character duties between three different characters who each represented a particular place style and approach to the content, and such I was never able to fully get behind any one of them. But CJ is the only one who could, in one mission, be tasked with killing enemy gang members in a drive-by, and in the next he can be told to raid Area 51 to steal a jetpack from the military. The absurdity of some missions and characters didn't bounce off him as much as it does the others, and I think that's due to the novelty of the setting. Instead of mafia movies, 80s crime dramas, and modern heist films, San Andreas took inspiration from 90s hood dramas, a genre that was tailor-made for satirizing American culture, since it was the result of the absurdities and unfairness of American culture. CJ is a small-time crook in Liberty City when he's called back home to Los Santos by his brother Sweet after their mother died in a drive-by. Upon arriving and grabbing a taxi from the airport, he's pulled over by Officer Tinpenny, who frames him for the death of an officer they killed 10 minutes ago to cover up their own crimes. Killing CJ's mom and framing him for the murder of a police officer was a setup to get CJ here to do their dirty work for them. But there's really no reason they had to specifically use CJ. There was nothing special about him before this. He's just a former Grove Street gang member who hasn't been around in several years. Who do you think was still playing the video game console in CJ's mama's house, considering I highly doubt it was his mama playing it? Also, it's really bizarre to keep a picture frame of yourself lying on the floor in front of the television. You picked the wrong house, fool! Hey, hey! Beloved scene, but Big Smoke is the one who broke in and has zero reason to be here. Shouldn't Big Smoke have already been at the cemetery instead of waiting around inside the deceased home with a bat? CJ's mom couldn't have been too popular in the community if the only people who showed up for her funeral were her three children and their two gang member friends. The lady didn't even get a tombstone or a pastor to say a few words for her. Balas drive by them as they're leaving the funeral, somehow failing to hit any of them and instead blowing up Big Smoke's car, which was all the way over to their left, meaning their aim must have been way off. Luckily, there were exactly four bicycles parked across the street for them to ride home. So when you running off again? I'm not. I'm thinking of staying. Why? My family, the homies is here. You are currently under the thumb of Tenpenny while you're here. At least tell Sweet what Tenpenny is doing to you. GTA San Andreas added a host of ancillary features like eating, weight, stat improvement, and weapon skills before fixing basic things like aiming and climbing a ladder. You have to regularly eat to keep CJ stamina up or else he'll starve to death, but eat too much and CJ will put on extra pounds that will slow you down which might require a trip to the gym. Getting buff allows you to punch harder and sprint longer. All of CJ's skills can be improved through use and training courses, from shooting, flying, driving, and swimming, unlocking new moves such as dual wielding and aiming while moving. As a series, GTA likes to experiment with new mechanics each game, with GTA 3 was going full 3D. 
and in Vice City was buying property in the last half of the game to waste your time on. GTA 4 had social lives you had to manage, while GTA 5 was all about switching between three characters and spending all your money online. Grove Street's families have been devastated by the crack epidemic. Ryder's solution is to take CJ and Rita cracked in to beat up Ballas, which is a very strange thing for Ryder to do, since Ryder is a Ballas guy bringing crack into Los Santos. How moms get killed? We gotta talk about it. I feel like this is a conversation you would have had with Sweet over the phone when he first told you about your mother dying, and not while on the way to get fast food after she's already been buried. Some people say they saw a green saber doing the work. Then speeding away. Ryder may as well mention that people say the driver was skinny and wore a hat, and that the shooter was overweight, since he just volunteered a description of the car they used to kill CJ and Sweet's mom. I'll have two number nines, a number nine large, a number six with extra dip, a number seven, two number 45s, one with cheese. Easily the most famous scene in the game these days, but is this the first time they've ever been through the drive through with Smoke? They're pretty shocked by the size of his order, but there's no way this is Smoke's first time ordering a lot of food with him. A baller car spots him in the drive through and 180s to go shoot up Grove Street while it's undefended. And I do mean specifically a baller car, since there's no one driving it. Why you ain't blast the smoke? I'll shoot him when I eat. Big Smoke busies himself eating while everyone else shoots at the ballas. It makes sense for him to give himself an excuse to not shoot at them, but Ryder has no problem shooting ballas. Also, Sweet and Big Smoke switch seats somehow since a cutscene in the drive thru. You guys were using automatic pistols to kill ballad drive buyers in the previous mission. Why are you so focused on getting 9mm semi automatics now? Man, you always crashing cars and shit, and for some reason now you back. All it is is CJ dry here, CJ dry there. There's something incredibly odd about an NPC complaining about the main character being told to drive all the time. During this mission, all four of them killed dozens of ballers in a drive-by. Can't imagine that going over well for Big Smoke and Ryder, since they are secretly part of the ballers. CJ has to rescue his brother who got caught sleeping with a girl who belongs to a different Grove Street family. I'm not seeing what sweet sees in this lady. Doesn't say a word from when we rescue her from being shot at to being dropped off at Grove Street. She's as mute as Claude from GTA 3. And look at you! Just like a hooker. That's how Kendall dressed at your mother's funeral, and you didn't have a problem with it then. Sweet's flipping out over Kendall dating Caesar, who's from a Mexican gang. He sends CJ to follow her, but apparently thought so far ahead that he got CJ a lowrider with hydraulics so he could compete in the car show. I don't know what Sweet was expecting. You can't just roll up in a lowrider with hydraulics and expect to not come away with a lifelong Mexican friend. My homie LB, he told me about this army mo got all the guns we need. Ryder wants to rob an old veteran's house for better hardware for Grove Street. The old timer weirdly has his guns and wooden crates scattered throughout his house. Mother done stole my rhymes. He's in East Flores. Hey, give me a strap. OG Logue is out of prison after he got himself sent up for something so he could start his gangster rap career with prison cred. Now he wants to get back at a Mexican gang member for sexually assaulting him while inside. We picked him up right outside of the prison, yet he's armed even though he was begging Sweet for a gun earlier. There's a train gonna make an unscheduled stop just down the way. It's got a, how you say, little something something on board for you, boy. Timpenny passes along information that a train carrying guns and ammo will be passing through town in the next five minutes, but he also tells the other gangs about it so they'll all fight over it. Strangely, he never even mentioned what the train was carrying to Ryder and CJ, so I have to take it that everyone already knew about this train and what it was carrying, because they all know it's worth dying over. Man, you want some of this? Nah, man, I'm cool on that. Man, don't do that. You'll saute the both of us. Yeah. Go hit the Get that wet. out of my face, Go man. hit the wet. Oh, oh that, come man. on, man. Have you ever noticed how Grand Theft Auto main characters up until Grand Theft Auto V all tended to reject drinking or drugs despite their criminal lifestyles? In this game, it reminds me of rap groups getting into the anti-drug PSA business in the 90s. Hey, Ryder, where we going? Ocean Docks. How we get this van? It wasn't outside when I came through. CJ is sending this game for me. Thanks, buddy. Are we up for this? It's National Guard, fool. Weekend soldiers. Ain't no match for Grove Street OGs. Instead of dismissing Ryder's plan to steal weapons from the U.S. military as a product of too much weed, CJ goes along with it, helping Ryder kill guardsmen and steal a truck from a U.S. National Guard base. All it took was one dead cop or Timpenny to put the fear of life in prison into CJ, but killing U.S. soldiers places zero pressure on the guy. Officer Tim Penny and his partner Pulaski are leaving Big Smoke's house just as CJ arrives. Big Smoke brushes it off as them interrogating him, and in the very next mission, he comes across Tim Penny and Pulaski leaving Big Smoke's house again, which Big Smoke once more brushes off. But a pattern is starting to form here that should start to make CJ ask questions. Based on CJ's own relationship with Tim Penny, he should know they wouldn't be here without reason. Some Vargas cats meeting some San Fierro reefer, cutting some kind of deal. San Fierro? I thought northern Mexicans don't mix with Los Santos S.A.s. Shit, you got me. 
that look like them. Big Smoke mentions a deal going down between two rival Mexican gangs at a train station. Whatever they were here to discuss is never revealed, and they appear to be having their meetup on the roof of the station, which they jump off onto a train as it pulls out, and Big Smoke demands CJ follow the damn train so he can shoot them. I'm just wondering what any of this has to do with us, and what killing them before they reach Los Santos' city limits even accomplishes. They're just some gang members. Also, the train passes right through a solid barrier at the end of the mission. Big Smoke then has CJ drive him to a building downtown where Russian mobsters hang out. He doesn't bother explaining why they're there, and just tells CJ to come in blasting if he hears trouble, which obviously happens, and then the two of them kill a bunch of Russians while escaping, which eventually results in the game ripping off the motorcycle chase scene from Terminator 2 while hundreds of Russians chase them in every vehicle they can down the river. Smoke couldn't have pissed them off that much in the 10 seconds he was inside their building. In the 90s, everything was made of volatile substances that would explode if you were too cool near it. Since OG Logue sucks at rapping, he wants CJ to steal Mad Dog's rhyme book, which CJ does, killing several of his guards along the way inside his home in the hills. Afterward, Logue wants CJ to kill Mad Dog's manager, who is apparently keeping Logue out of the rap game, even though he hasn't heard any of Logue's music and wouldn't need to keep him out since Logue sucks. The manager is currently attending a music award show and gets all of Mad Dog's security who just recently had a break-in where several guards were killed and his rhyme book stolen, but they don't seem to be on alert. Now you get this straight. We own you. You're ours. We can shit on you from such a height, you'll think God himself has crapped on you. It's weird that a Grand Theft Auto game would use the murder of a single cop to frame the main character when I regularly kill scores of police in the game with no consequences. Ludo narrative wasn't Rockstar's strong suit back then. While burning the house to kill the man Timpany wants dealt with, CJ accidentally traps a woman inside and he has to rescue her. He can then take the lady he almost was murdered out on dates, and she doesn't seem to care about the whole ordeal, the deaths of everyone she was just hanging around with. The game expects you to take over gang territory in Los Santos by first looking for gang members on the street, then killing enough of them on their turf to start a gang war, where more gang members show up that you have to kill. Afterward, their territory belongs to Grove Street, but you can lose it if you don't defend it, so you'll receive calls begging you to show up and deal with gang wars on your own turf. The game introduced this mechanic a little early, since not long after this it kicks you out of Los Santos and any territory you captured is lost until the end of the game when you have to reclaim it if you want to finish, so you're better off ignoring it until then, and then complaining about it loudly to anyone who will listen. I do it regularly at drive throughs I'm really popular in my local Burger King. I like the status quo, Carl. I like having all you bastards doing my job for me, blowing each other's guts all over the side. Dumb bastards. Now, if it's brought to my attention that one tribe gets an unfair advantage over another, that truly troubles me, Carl. Tenpenny wanting to keep himself out of prison and maintain his egotistical sense of being a public defender makes sense. It's the rest of his plans that don't square up. He wants to pit the gangs against each other so they kill themselves off and he can keep them under control. But all the gangs seem to know this and go along with it. He tells Sweet about a baller funeral they can drive by and in the next mission makes CJ destroy a warehouse full of Russian weapons the ballers are going to buy, and they never seem to realize that he's probably dropping info like this to the ballers in Las Tecas. But the thing is, Tim Penny seems to have clearly sided with the ballers when it comes to letting them take over the streets and wipe out Grove Street, using Big Smoke to do it. So these missions where he cripples the ballers don't seem to serve any function besides busy work for CJ. The Grove Street families are gathering in a motel to plan their gang war to crush the ballas, but it's interrupted by a police raid. The cop murder Tim Penny pinned on CJ could not possibly still be leveraged, since CJ kills half the police force during the course of this one mission while rescuing Sweet. Didn't know cops were suicidal in their pursuit of a bust, since these cops hovering just above the ground in their chopper try to ram the car with the blades, a move that would kill the cops as well. While getting armed up to take down the ballas, CJ gets a call from Caesar, Kendall's boyfriend, who wants to meet up to show him something. Ryder and Big Smoke are hanging out with the ballas and Tinpenny, and more importantly than that, they have a green saber, the one that killed CJ's mom in a drive-by. Why would Big Smoke have a specific vehicle for betraying his gang? And why would he keep it after it already been spotted the first time he used it? It's just evidence at that point. Not that the mystery of who killed CJ's mom even matters. CJ never brings it up or shows any anger over his former friends killing his mom. Ryder betraying Grove Street is out of place for him, and his missions focus on arming the Grove, killing ballas, and disrupting crack dealing. And his betrayal is almost invisible to CJ, who doesn't even mention him alongside Big Smoke in this cutscene. Look, go get Kendall and take her to a safe place. What you thinking? It's sweet. I think him and the homies is walking into a trap. Now that he knows the truth about Big Smoke, CJ figures that Sweet and the gang are walking into a trap. He races a Sweet and fights off the ballas until the police arrive. Sweet is arrested, but Tenpenny and Pulaski take CJ out into the country to continue doing their dirty work for them, telling him that Sweet will remain alive in prison as long as CJ cooperates. They want him to deal with an associate of theirs who has gone to internal affairs over Tenpenny and is now in witness protection on Mount Chiliad, proving that witness protection is worthless in GTA, since the people they try to protect witnesses from always seem to know exactly where they're being hidden. 
Caesar sends his cousin Catalina, the antagonist of GTA 3, to Whetstone to watch CJ's back. She wants to rob multiple businesses in the county, your pick of the order. While trying to knock over a gas station, instead of walking inside and robbing them, Catalina stands outside and threatens them through the bulletproof glass. So instead, she steals a big rig and its fuel tanker outside. This isn't exactly making Catalina out to be someone clever enough to run the entire Colombian cartel in Grand Theft Auto 3. Tenpenny wants CJ to frame a DA for possession, but demands CJ also come up with the money to pay Mr. Truth for the weed. Meanwhile, Mr. Truth wants CJ to steal a combine harvester from some right-wing survivalist fascist on a nearby farm. I don't really know why Truth needs a combine. You wouldn't use one to harvest weed since weed requires a lot of tedious hand trimming of the buds. The most he might be able to use it for would be hemp farming. No, eh? Oh, baby, baby. I'm so sorry, baby. Well, what's that? You so right. Please forgive me, baby. I think I love you. Catalina calls CJ over and his attitude is like that of a man trying to negotiate with a jilted girlfriend. It's downright odd how they both act like they're in a relationship now out of the blue. Just, just don't f***ing shoot me, please! Based on what I know of Catalina's shooting skills from Grand Theft Auto 3, she could pull the trigger and CJ would almost certainly survive. I'm, I'm gonna play with you so rough, baby. Keep talking! Yeah, yeah, and, and I'll take you to rob banks and sh Oh. And, you know, I, I'll let you kill anyone you want to kill. Mm -hmm. uh -uh. Dating used to be so much simpler back in the 90s. The liquor store is robbed by rednecks on ATVs just as you arrive, and Catalina demands you chase down the thieves instead of knocking over one of the other stores in town. This is a rock. I'm gonna no, torture babe, your sorry no, ass. Please, no. Do never write to me. After they cut the hot coffee minigame because of how off-putting it looked and because of how much trouble would get them in legally, they should have also cut Catalina and CJ engaging in S&M because it's several minutes of long penning shots of Catalina's cabin while audio plays over it. Think about all the under-18 kids playing this game. Leave the panic button or I'll kill your children too! I warned you, you stupid bitch! Stupid! While robbing a betting shop, Catalina warns the tellers not to push the panic button. When one of them does, she shoots the two innocent people there to place bets who couldn't press the button and leaves the tellers alone. CJ detonates a satchel charge inside the same room he's standing in. Baby, I'm sorry. I gave to you as a woman. No! No more! From now on, we just business partners. This relationship began without any context or development, and it ends in the exact same way. Robbing a bank with Catalina, huh? I'd be wary of that one. This car? This is my new man. Are you jealous? Are you going to fight for me? Claude kept this relationship going for nine years or so despite Catalina only dating him despite CJ. So he had to be doing something right. Why is this race so popular with disabled people like Blind Woozy and the Mute Claude? Damn man, it must be two tons of that stuff back there. This is the 90s. You don't need two tons of weed to frame someone. Hell, Tim Penny could have just used a bag of crack that's easily available. We gotta torch those fields. I only hope Kaya can forgive us. Burning the weed fields would not destroy the evidence of you growing weed, especially when you have CJ shoot the chopper down with a rocket launcher after you finish burning it all, turning this drug possession charge into another police killing. The garage CJ won from Claude is a dump and he's pretty upset over it. Apparently he was going to become a legitimate business owner. The first thing he does is convince two mechanics and Zero, an electronics whiz, to work for him. Zero's missions feel like they came out of Bully instead of Grand Theft Auto. His first mission begins with CJ overhearing the beeping from waves of RC bomber planes controlled by Zero's rival Berkeley while still inside. Zero's RC shop. This can't be the first time Berkeley's ever done this before if he's mounted a minigun to his roof. Either that or Zero is preparing for some crazy riots. The worst mission in the entire game as CJ steering an RC plane around and refueling mid-mission to keep going. No other vehicle in this series requires you to refuel, but they made that change for this one RC plane, and none of the other RC vehicles you control in the very next mission. Tenpenny wants the weed planted inside the DA's car, so CJ steals a valet uniform and takes his car from a hotel to his garage to plant the stuff, somehow sticking two tons of weed inside the trunk of his sedan. For comparison, this is what two tons of seized weed looks like. I don't think you'd even need that much to ruin this guy. That much would only make people ask questions since you wouldn't just casually drive around with two tons of weed in your car, especially since he would have no fingerprints on the packages. What the f is going on? Do I look like a hooker to you? What? Those assholes keep saying sh to me. Who said this to you? The construction workers up that hill. I'm a Come on. Nah, hold up. I got this. The appropriate response is someone catcalling your sister is to destroy all their construction equipment, then shove the porta potty with the site manager inside it, who likely did nothing, into a ditch and bury it in concrete. Hey, my cousin just called me. 
He gave me a tip about a baller's car going to San Fierro to score yay. Caesar is the divining rod for collusion between the antagonists. He's just always learning vitally important info and calling CJ to meet up and spread the news. Here he calls CJ to the Mahalan interchange so they can follow the courier vehicle for the crack flowing into Los Santos all the way to a restaurant in the countryside where Ryder gets out to meet with the three other members of the cartel, Jizzy B, T-Bone Mendez, and Torino. It makes no sense for Ryder to be the Bala's man in the crack syndicate. He was the one who led CJ on a mission to bust up a Bala crack den in the first place. Well look, Woozy, I need to get some info from you, man. And what exactly do you boys want to know? Who are these putas, Holmes? CJ asks a blind man to look at some photos to tell him who they are. Hey, did he my way in? How I get to him? Oh, Jizzy? Jizzy runs the Pleasure Domes Club in that old fortress under the Gap Bridge. Jizzy is CJ's way into the cartel, which ends up being incredibly easy to get into. All he has to do is get into Jizzy's pleasure dome and offer his services while playing dumb. Jizzy's first job for CJ is figure out who's murdering his girls, but first he wants you to drop off one of his girls to her place, take out a rival pimp trying to turn his hose, kill two guys beating up one of his girls, then stop the sugar daddy priest of the girl CJ dropped off from taking her off the streets. You end up killing both the girl and the priest, so Jizzy lost his girl and a client, and that's just the first day on the job, and already this man has suffered a pretty bad financial blow. Oh, don't be such a beachy liability. Liability? Liability for what? Now there's three of us and I'm getting 20%. What type of math is that? That's fools math, player! That math doesn't check out even more than Jizzy knows, because there's four of you counting Ryder, but for some reason he doesn't seem to count. Who are you? Okay, just keep talking. Hey, Holmes, Mike's in trouble. Let's bounce. How was Mike Torino able to stay hidden in the back of the van and call T-Bone when the van is full of goons who pop out of it to shoot at you? Also, Torino has a gun, so he could have just shot the driver or the people inside instead of telling T-Bone what he was hearing so they could track him down. We gotta torch this van with the coke in it. Hey, Charlie, where do we ain't torching nada? This is a setback, but doing 20 to life is a little more than that, comprende amigo? Why did this gang even drive their stolen van full of drugs onto an airport runway? Those tend to be pretty tightly secured. Jizzy tells CJ that T-Bone is waiting for him in a sedan outside a gas station. He arrives and there's no one around besides the car, which CJ hops into, somehow missing T-Bone in the back seat when he gets in. <laughs> I almost had you, man. T-Bone was crouched down inside the back of that car for hours while CJ waited for someone to show up. Also, he could pull a prank. Mike Torino wants CJ to clear roadblocks so his next van makes it to the factory. If you know where this gang has placed roadblocks, just have the van take a different route instead of shooting up the city. Tenpenny and Pulaski show up at the garage tasking CJ with killing a journalist and reporter looking into them. This ends up being another mission where you have to follow a train on a motorcycle, though I'm pretty sure CJ could have gotten on board this one instead of following behind it. Uh, you know of the boss's curse. Curse? Nah. He's blind. Blind? But we was just racing cars last week. Woozy's blindness makes him the only NPC in the game with an excuse for running face first into walls. Doesn't explain how he can drive cars in off-road races and lean out a window to shoot at pursuing Vietnamese gang members if he can't walk without running into something. A Vietnamese gang surprised the Blood Feathers triad and wiped them out. Then they come back for round two even though they had no way of knowing there would be anyone here for them to kill on their return trip. So many missions in GTA games will offer an excuse for why criminals would even use the main character for a particular job. For this one, Woozy claims CJ wouldn't draw the attention of the Vietnamese gang while picking up a package at the airport since they wouldn't be expecting a non-Chinese person. But as soon as you get in the car with the package, the gang is onto you. So the excuse is hardly needed since it never leads to CJ being incognito. We were followed here. The Da Nang boys are watching this apartment. As soon as we leave, they will attempt an assassination. Hey, what's the big deal? Why don't you cruise on out of here, lead them to a place quiet, and cap they flat asses? Or, hear me out, you could just kill the Vietnamese gang members outside right now without leading them out into the countryside. I'm blind. No sh You don't get to act like Woozy's blindness is obvious to you now when you didn't even know until his bodyguard told you. How are you in the water? What you mean? Can I swim? Yeah. Can you swim well? No, I can't. Since there's been no reason to swim up until now, CJ's swimming skill will be too low to start the mission. So you'll have to go swim in the ocean for 10 to 20 minutes to build it up for what ends up being the only mission in the game where swimming is important. Swimming all the way out to a Vietnamese container ship while dodging patrol boats all the way in order to sneak on board and place a bug. Fortunately for CJ, all the gang members on the ship are armed only with combat knives. Oh. They're getting a helicopter to do a couple of flybys of the ship. Why do we need to place a bug on the boat of the very next mission as CJ getting into a chopper with one of Woozy's boys and shooting everyone on board it? The chopper takes a hit from an RPG and crashes into the water, but CJ survives, losing all of his weapons except for his blade. So once again, you have to make your way through the ship with a knife. Essentially, they got two missions for the price of developing one. 
The Vietnamese were keeping refugees in the hold at CJ Rescues. They tell him that the snake hat leader is up on the bridge. An old Vietnamese man wielding a katana like that's part of his Vietnamese cultural heritage just because he's Asian. You okay? Yeah. Woozy left a message to say I gotta go get Jizzy's phone after he made the call. Then I can ambush the meat and take down those baller pushers from Los Santos. CJ needs a silenced weapon in order to steal Jizzy's phone so he can discover and ambush the meeting of the cartel members. That's why he was looking for a welder to rig one up. But instead, Caesar has a silenced handgun under his tool cart, like he was going to need that while adding hydraulics to a car. What was the point of that silence pistol CJ needed again? CJ was weirdly barred from the Pleasure Dome even though he works for Jizzy, and he had to sneak into the rafters. I don't even remember killing anyone with this thing. Jizzy's bodyguards just sit there and cower even when CJ has his back to them. They only make a move once Jizzy tells them to. Using the message Jizzy received on the phone, CJ and Caesar track the cartel to Pier 69, where Ryder will be meeting with other members of the cartel. Despite being the baller's point man in this cartel, Ryder was never mentioned by any of them or seen outside of these meetings. If you go looking for answers online, Ryder was apparently never supposed to betray Grove Street like Big Smoke. That would explain why his inclusion in this cartel is so awkward and why his death is so pointless and devoid of any impact. He tries to get away on a boat and you shoot it until it blows up while he spouts old lines instead of any original dialogue. That was my homie. And I killed him. Midget deserved it, eh? Little asshole tried to bang your sister, you know that? No. For real? The fact that Caesar randomly mentions that Ryder tried to bang Kendall only made Ryder's role during the second act of the storyline even more poorly written, considering nothing was mentioned that even hinted at that alleged action. It'd have been so much more in character for Ryder to remain loyal to Grove Street, but be killed during the trap set by Big Smoke. Woozy tells CJ to destroy the cartel's crack factory. His man wires up a bomb that CJ drives in and parks next to the chemicals. Afterward, Torino calls CJ using a very obvious voice filter that CJ doesn't pick up on and tells him that he has information on his brother and to meet him at his ranch, which CJ does. Now first we need to see what you're made of. What it look like I'm made of? Putin? No, anger and hate. And that's what I like about you. Hey, there's a truck in the garage. I say we take it for a spin. Torino already knows CJ is a pretty capable person. He did destroy his cartel and save his life after all, so there's no point testing his ability to follow GPS coordinates. Hey, I'm down. Man, you ain't number the Yayo dealer anyway, Torino. Shut up and sit down. What, you think I'm a drug dealer? And what, you think you're a crusader for good? The first thing Torino did upon meeting CJ was have T-Bone grab his wallet so he could confirm his identity. And since Torino seems to know pretty much everything about CJ, there's no way he didn't know what CJ was up to when working for the cartel and that Ryder was his former friend. But he never acted on any of that to stop CJ from wiping out his cartel. He's not all that upset about all of his wasted drug cartel work though. Turns out Torino works for a government agency. He was only pretending to sell drugs while actually selling them in order to fund other activities battling communism or something. A little late for a vague Iran and Contra reference in a game set in the 90s after the wall came down. I need you to commandeer a truck. A rival agency with a confused social agenda. They got things that we need. This rival agency's truck looks an awful lot like a fuel truck for gas stations. He's in prison upstate. D-Wing, cell 13. To the left, I got a child killer who wants to rip his throat out. Based on what I know about prison culture, the child killer would be in the most danger in a general prison population. Not sweet. Torino's missions are based around international espionage. It's kind of difficult to suspend my disbelief when all the spy stuff happens within US borders against unnamed US agencies. It also doesn't seem to have an end goal. He just waves in the direction of fighting US enemies using drastic actions without explaining anything. It's amazing. What's up now, Torino? This history, it's all lies. It says Hitler killed himself and then we nuked Japan. And people believe this. I think there must have been a misunderstanding between the writer and the 3D modeler. Torino is reading a book titled Conspiracy Theories and mentions dropping a nuke on Japan and killing Hitler as things he can't believe people accept as the truth. But if he's reading these things in a book called Conspiracy Theories, then they're likely onto these historical events being false within the world of GTA. So there are people who don't believe it and he's reading their book about not believing the narrative. Torino was way more proactive when he was running a drug smuggling ring, which CJ just lets him get away with. This is the guy responsible for filling the streets of Los Santos with crack, also he could fund foreign espionage activities off the back of the misery of CJ's friends and family, which indirectly led to the death of CJ's mom. CJ had no problem killing all the other cartel members, but Torino he gives a pass to. Now listen, I need you to buy me some property, okay? Shouldn't cost that much. You offer them a dollar. 
If they give you a hard time, kill them. Torino orders CJ to buy an airfield for a dollar and kill the owner if they try to argue. But there's no owner present to even argue price over, and you have to pay 80000 out of pocket for the property. Unfortunately, this means you have to go through a flight school that Torino somehow set up and automated and set an airfield that he's never been to, and we just bought. Flying in GTA San Andreas is quite the experience, equivalent to steering a squirrel by swearing at it while it ignores your thrown peanuts. So they had to put you through classes before turning you loose with the missions. Woozy is opening a casino in Las Venturas, but the local mobs are trying to pressure Woozy out. One of the mafia goons got caught trying to bust up their machines, so CJ has him tied to the roof of a car so he can scare him into revealing which family he works for by driving dangerously down the freeway. You could do this with him inside the car as well, and if CJ did crash, you would probably die along with the guy. You're gonna need a crew and some special equipment. Yeah, it'll take some explosives. Always gotta blow up to pull a heist. You know what? There's an open cast mine southwest of the city limits. They must have explosives. Earlier, Woozy knew a guy who equipped a car with enough explosives to destroy an entire crack warehouse. But CJ has to go scour a mine to steal dynamite, which he does by running over wooden crates with a multi-ton earth mover, because wooden crates are apparently indestructible. Why is the dynamite said to explode right next to all the mining equipment and with miners walking around right next to it? Delivery for Woozy. Hey, you be careful with that. Be careful with that dynamite, says Guy who ran over all of it in a truck. Oh yeah, the dragon on this got the sunglasses and a white stick. Insolent bastards! If you're going to counterfeit casino chips, why would you counterfeit them so poorly? Truth calls CJ for help finding a missing band along with her manager who he took into the desert on a peyote trip. He finds two of them on top of a mountain, but the rest of the band is missing. They check a snake farm verse where Macker apparently slept with a pig, then slept with a farmer's daughter, giving her crabs that she then gave to her brother. Weirdly, Macker himself never complains about having crabs though. So when I came out, I started representing the Liberty City mob. Again, and that's how I ended up here. But no one family would trust another family to run the casino, so I was put forth as a neutral party. Why would any Liberty City Mafia family trust Ken Rosenberg to be a neutral party to their casino operation after he sided with Tommy Versetti against him down in Vice City? This isn't even that different from how they positioned Rosenberg back in Vice City. He was supposed to be the intermediate there as well. My only friend is a bird named Tony. I never f***ed anyone over in my life who didn't have it coming to him. Can't have Tommy Versetti back since Ray Liotta had a falling out with the developer. Just have a parrot that quotes Scarface instead. While falling off the wagon during a coke bender, Ken Rosenberg drags CJ along to meet with Johnny. The mafia guy, CJ strapped to the hood of a car, would somehow put him in a coma. Upon seeing CJ, he has a heart attack and dies, which leads to some beautiful cinematography. When this mobster throws a Molotov cocktail in slow motion inside their own meatpacking factory to somehow kill CJ by setting the hallway on fire. We got a problem. I got some guys out in the field need some equipment. If they don't get it, they'll be dead by nightfall. Torino's spy business makes no damn sense. Why are we pretending to be resupplying people like they're in the middle of nowhere? It's a small town next to several major cities. This isn't Bosnia. Another agency doing the same Iran-Contra scam of propping up dictators by selling weapons decides to land at Torino's airfield to load up. Since apparently, US spy agencies can't use existing infrastructure of the US government and have to use airfields of known rogue agents. Torino gives CJ the go-ahead to kill them by placing a bomb on their plane, so he has to race to get up the ramp before it takes off, while barrels fall out behind it. One of the agents is just randomly wearing a parachute for some reason. You typically only put one of those on if you're planning to jump out of a plane, which these guys weren't. But it works out in CJ's favor, since jumping is his only way off the plane. Still the best mission in the game regardless of everything I just said though. Truth is upset by CJ working for Torino and encourages him to raid Area 69. Decades before some guy on Twitter had the idea about clapping alien cheeks in Area 51. What's going on? Everything is going on. Don't you get it? There's a place, not even on the map. A train is about to leave. It can explain. Better than I ever can. Boy, this is going to blow your f***ing mind. I feel like CJ would need more context than some hippie telling him to seek answers to questions CJ isn't even asking by breaking into a top secret government base before he would ever go and do it. The Black Project was a jetpack, which doesn't exactly scream technology you need a secret military base and black budget for. You can find people crowdfunding the development of jetpacks these days. Truth told CJ back when they were moving the pod that he hasn't driven in decades, yet in this mission he had no trouble driving and even somehow drove his van to the top of a mesa that has no road. Land on the train, kill the guards, get in and steal the stuff. Oh yeah? What stuff? I don't know yet. Oh, <laughs> you don't know yet. You went and broke into a secret government research base on Less From Truth. He didn't even tell you what he wanted you to do there. At least here, the directions are clear. Use jetpack to board train, kill soldiers, and then steal whatever. In this case, a canister of green goo. Despite our best efforts, 
The gig's nearly up. Timpany tells CJ the gig is almost up, which I believe, since every mission of his has been focused on covering up the corruption, and you can only kill so many whistleblowers. This time he wants CJ to intercept a DA officer meeting with an FBI agent in a ruined town in the desert to hand over a dossier. This is simply government paperwork. They could and would do this in a formal location instead of the middle of nowhere. Salvatore Leone from GTA 3 arrives in Las Venturas to deal with the issues surrounding Rosenberg and the Caligula Club. The Ferrellis are sending guys to kill Salvatore Leone, and CJ offers to take care of them. CJ must have been convinced he was doing a Red Bull sponsorship, and not a contract killing. Rather than wait for them to arrive and kill them on the ground, he engages in some Mission Impossible insanity by stealing an airplane from the airport, meeting up with their plane in midair, bailing out without a parachute to grab onto the private jet, and somehow opening the hatch from the outside so he can kill them before they land. Tim Penny calls CJ and tells him to meet at the location where people are obviously betrayed. Since killing everyone who has turned over state's evidence against him has worked out so well for Tenpenny, he kills Officer Hernandez for going to the DA over the murder of Officer Pindleberry, then has CJ dig a grave while he goes to get drunk and laid, taking the police cruiser with him and stranding Officer Pulaski, who he leaves to watch over and finish off CJ, in the desert without a ride. He seems cool with it though. CJ is saved when Pendleton wakes up and attacks Pulaski, who shoots him, and then both CJ and Pulaski just sort of awkwardly stand there looking into the grave instead of trying to kill each other. Of course, once the cutscene ends, the tone is different. Pulaski is running away instead of shooting CJ, who he still had the drop on. CJ kills Pulaski, and there are no consequences for doing that. No murder of a cop pinned on him, Sweet isn't killed in prison, and Timpenny doesn't even seem to notice. CJ runs into Mad Dog about to jump off the roof after losing all of his money in the casino and his career due to everything CJ did to help out Luke. To save him, CJ has to grab a nearby truck filled with cardboard boxes and then play a minigame straight out of an Atari game. Feel the weight of the weapon, sweetheart. <laughs> I can feel the weight of someone's weapon. Hey, you're the one to blame on that front. No matter which GTA game she appears in, Maria is sexually exploited by someone. In a callback to a mission from GTA 3, Salvatore wants CJ to kill everyone inside St. Mark's Bistro. Instead of taking a flight to Liberty City like a real person, CJ can only steal a plane from the airport again and fly there himself. When you consider this would be a 10 to 12 hour flight from the west coast to the east coast, I'm not even sure how Salvatore knew who would be inside the restaurant when CJ finally arrived. This what we gonna plan, hi Sam. Anyone else coming? Nah. Couldn't we have done this in my office? You gotta have a secret place to plan shit like this, that's just how it's done. Your secret meeting place for planning a heist on the Caligula Club is just on the other side of an unlocked door on the casino floor. What's more, you guys already run your own casino. A money printing machine. It's like a bank manager going and robbing another bank. Before they can even begin, CJ needs to get his hands on the blueprints for the Caligula Club. He heads over to the city records office, but reproduction of the plans is forbidden. Even though the office has the blueprints CJ needs plastered all over the wall for some reason. So CJ destroys air conditioning units by punching them, causing a fire to distract the guards. After taking photos of the blueprints, cops show up even though there's no crime reported, and cops would not be rushing into a burning building before firemen. I'm honestly surprised you don't hear more discussion about this mission. It's basically a free article for a gaming news site wanting some easy rage clicks. CJ requires an employee security card for the heist mission. CJ's plan to get one is… well… First, he follows one of the Caligula Club's croupier staff to a sex shop, where he overhears her planning a meetup with her dom that night at her home. CJ then buys a gimp suit to conceal his identity, follows the woman home, kills her dom before he arrives and takes his place, in case I need to spell it out for you. To complete this mission, you have to commit sexual assault. It just so conveniently happens that Millie is such a freak that she's into it and even gives CJ her employee security card after a few more dates. Okay, look. I'ma go shut off the city's power source. Woozy, look after these fools for me. Don't you think blowing the generators at the city's hydroelectric dam is a little extreme? Shutting down the power to the entire city is gonna cripple Woozy's casino as well. And this is done just to turn off the lights in the Caligula Club, not shut down any of the security. Destroying the generators of the dam requires CJ to once again steal a plane from the airport, jump out over the dam and parachute down to it, where there's a combat knife stashed at the landing point for some unknown reason. Then planned explosive charges on the generators, which the staff will never discover despite knowing someone broke in, then escaping by diving off the top of the dam and into the water which would kill you. The next stage of the heist plan is stealing police motorcycles to escort the bank truck full of money. To do so, CJ takes Woozy's right-hand man and has him drive a packer truck down the freeway while he steals police motorbikes and drives them onto the moving packer instead of just taking them somewhere and stashing them. It's gonna be awfully hard to lock down a bike on a moving tow truck. Okay, we got the bikes and Woozy taking care of the uniforms. Now we just gotta get an armored van and respray it with the Caligula's Casino logo. 
Why don't we steal one while it's on its rounds? That way we can make some money too. Nah, I don't want to get the crew caught up in some street level jack and it could get up. Um, you just stole four motorcycles from the police for this heist, but stealing a Caligula security van is so dangerous, CJ has to steal a Sky Crane helicopter from a military fuel dump and use that to steal a security van and repaint it. I definitely think you took the harder path here, pal. The heist ends up being fairly straightforward. CJ disguises himself as a croupier, uses Millie's employee card to get around, tosses gas grenades into a ventilation dock to knock out guards at the vault, then Zero detonates the bombs of the dam, shutting off power to the whole city and turning out the lights in the club. Though I do find it strange that CJ is the only member of the team to bring night vision goggles knowing they would be in total darkness. Woozy is the only other one that could get around in this pretty well. With all that planning, you would think it was done to avoid fighting their way to the vault to steal the cash. After all, that's why heist plans are usually necessary, but CJ and his team still need to fight their way there. They could have just walked through the front doors and blasted their way down and it would have gone just as well. What's the problem? Somebody's trying to bring the emergency generators back up. Zero's rival, Berkeley, knows about their heist and attempts to restart the backup generators, but CJ blows them up with satchel charges. But then later on, the lights come back on anyway despite the city's hydroelectric generators being blown, along with the casino's own backup generators gone. That's some hacking Berkeley was able to do, routing power from nowhere. With the rest of the team escaping in the security van and police motorcycles, CJ has to act as a distraction by making his way to the roof, fighting off the police, and then jumping off with a parachute that is just up here for some reason. You know what? I'm getting bored here. I'm trying to do business, not audition midgets. People of reduced stature, you mean? Yeah, yeah, I said that. Woozy would later go on to get a job at Disney and be responsible for casting the live-action version of Snow White. Mad Dog shows up fresh from rehab, and CJ is down for helping the guy he destroyed the life of without ever fessing up that he was the one who turned his life upside down in the first place. Mad Dog traded his mansion to a drug dealer. To take it back, CJ parachutes from a plane to the mansion and infiltrates it. I'm starting to think this game was designed while anticipating the release of Metal Gear Solid 3 a month later. This is also another case of the devs getting two missions for the price of developing one, since CJ already raided Mad Dog's mansion once before. Finally, I thought I'd never get through to you. Torino hacks Mad Dog's sound booth while they're recording to get a hold of CJ for one last job instead of, you know, calling his cell phone like he did every other time. In return for freeing his brother's suite, Torino wants CJ to steal a jet from an amphibious assault ship and use it to destroy a fleet of foreign spy ships, meaning CJ has to kill a bunch of US Marines and steal military equipment so he can commit an act of war by destroying another nation's ships. Recall when this story was about gang members protecting their hood, because it's about to awkwardly shift back to that after all the spy nonsense and CJ shooting down fighter pilots. What's mine is yours and you know that. You never did get it, did you, Carl? I need to go check on things in the hood. Man, that's the problem. You always a perpetrator, running from what's real. Hey, man, shit's f***ed up there. You don't want to be in the hood. No. That's exactly where I want to be. The weird thing is, Sweet is berating CJ for abandoning Grove Street, but abandoning Grove Street is exactly what happens by the time of Grand Theft Auto V. Why is Los Santos hood so messed up? The cartel that was pushing drugs into it was destroyed, so the supply should have dried up by now. I knew there was something familiar about those rhymes he was kicking. They're from my rhyme book. Mad Dog discovers that OG Loke is using the rhyme book CJ stole from him, so CJ suggests they drop by and get it back. Loke may be a terrible rapper, but he's never screwed over CJ, and CJ had no problem helping him get where he is by stealing from Mad Dog. When they confront him, Loke never mentions how CJ is the one who stole the rhyme book in the first place and killed Mad Dog's old manager. Jeffrey, you a bust, straight bitch. You stabbed me and my brother in the back. How so? I don't recall Loke doing anything to you or your brother. CJ is the hypocrite here. Yeah. How do you charge Eddie Pulaski with racketeering, corruption, narcotics, and sexual assault when he's dead? Supposedly, they never found his body, but CJ left him for dead on the side of the freeway. The district attorney's office has seen fit to drop all charges. What? In the same broadcast where charges were announced on Tin Penny, the DA drops the charges due to lack of evidence. Then seconds after that, Los Santos is on fire and in the grip of a riot. The citizens didn't even have time to get wound up by the charges before Tim Penny escaped from justice. Hell, that's not even long enough to make Molotovs. Unlike every other Grand Theft Auto game, San Andreas actually has a solid buildup of tension and end goals with its climax, as well as two villains who have been developed properly from the start of the game and you care about taking them down. All they have to do now is not waste your time by, say, forcing you to take over all the gang territory in Los Santos to begin the final mission. CJ have been thinking. The city's big, but it ain't that big. Some fools know where smoke's hiding. But as long as the grocery families don't rule the streets, his money's gonna mean more than our rep. What you got in mind? We gotta hit those bombs and violence with everything. Hit every neighborhood they got. Oh well. Back to square one, I guess. Look, I know you down for this, but I gotta go in there alone. What? 
Smoke played me. Tan Penny played me. Why is this so personal to you when you haven't even cared about that until just now? When the game required you to, so this could be a solo mission. Smoke's crack fortress has a hallway big enough to drive a SWAT tank down along with an army of ballas inside. Why was it so difficult to find this place that I had to take over the entire city before learning about it? I never understood how Big Smoke became the leader of the ballas just because he betrayed Grove Street. Sure, maybe they would have given him a spot in the gang, but he's running the show. Smoke turns off the lights so you can't see him. But because this game uses lock-on targeting, you can see Smoke just fine and still lock on to him and shoot him. We was like family, homie. I had no choice. I had to do it. I just see the opportunity <coughs> of when I'm gone, everyone gonna remember my name. Big Smoke! Oh. Everyone remembers you for a fast food order and for telling them to follow the damn train. I don't think anyone cared for Big Smoke once he turned heel. Though that's due more to Rockstar not using him again until the very end, when he just tells CJ he doesn't care about anything. It's honestly a huge waste. I would have liked to have seen how becoming a drug lord changed Smoke. Oh, I almost forgot, Carl. Time to die. Uh, sweet! What? My Something tells me they trained police not to fall for that trick. CJ left Sweet inside a car. Why jump onto the ladder of the fire truck Tenpenny is escaping in rather than chase after him in the car? For someone catching a flight out of San Andreas, Tenpenny never drives toward the airport and crashes in Grove Street after losing control of the fire truck. It's cool. No need to put a bullet in him. He killed himself in a traffic accident. No one to blame. Like that matters after I've killed cops, federal agents, National Guardsmen, and Marines. Ah oh, shit, here we go again. Hey there, thanks for watching a non-essay video on a game. I'm sure that couldn't have been easy. If you enjoyed it, you can do the usual of liking and subscribing. But if you want even more content not found here on YouTube, you can check out my Patreon, where I recently sent Grand Theft Auto 3, and will be sending Grand Theft Auto Vice City in a week or so. Summer's almost over, so it's about time I start sending some new games. So see you next time with whichever of these two games you vote the most for. Special thanks to Ben. Roman Are You Sleeping, Nervous Nelly, Xavier Distalis, Notorious SKP, Max Headroom, DJ Nelson, Azaneth the Succubus, Musical Pumpkin, Pedro, Castle Mania, Zinro, Michelle C, Yaroslav Golubev, Dennis O'Brien, Mal Rose, Jake B, Donald Talbot, Montezuma, Aaron Hines, Sky is Under, Eric Kisser, Shadow Wolf Gaming, Purple Jaeger, Church Quinones, Storm Queen Suki, S Venus, Mario Neto, Ben Hottie, Gellis, Biohazard A, and Charmsy.